Hi, John. Hey, Bob. How you doing? I'm doing really well, and I just have to tell you, because I know this has been a, a big concern of yours over the years, um, I've been meditating lately. Really? I've been meditating steadily ever since the beginning of this semester. So, you know, I, I, I saw at the end of the summer, and we talked about Buddhism and meditation, and then I got back to my school, and uh, one of my colleagues, um, a, uh, an historian who specializes in black history, turns out to be an avid meditator, and she has taught a little class in mindfulness every Tuesday and Thursday, half-hour session. And I've done it. I haven't missed a single session. And uh, the, only, the only downside is that I – Right after I leave this thing, I have to go to a freshman composition course that I teach, which harshes my, my mellow a little bit. Um, but it should, but your mellow should allow you to handle the harshness better if, if things it, are working right. It kind of does. And early on, I was so enthusiastic, I even led the students in a session. That's, I, John, oh, that's too enthusiastic. <laughs> you know, I... The funny thing was, I, it only lasted for about five minutes. I told them to close their eyes. I did some of the things that my colleague Lindsay does, and uh, I said, focus on your breath and your body and try to let all your thoughts go. And at the end, I asked them, I asked for a show of hands. I said, how many of you actually succeeded in emptying your minds? Well, that's a and, lot to ask for in five minutes. Well, yeah. Uh, so... More than half of them raised their hands. They're and lying. I, They're lying. You should you should give them bad grades. Those are lies. <laughs> Dead. I said, "There's no way." I said, "You can't empty your mind like that." I mean, I all I do is think about what I'm going to say in my class while I'm in my mindfulness. Man, meditation. You, you, you're really like a nasty professor. It's one thing to inflict <laughs> this weird exercise on them that has nothing to do with the class. Then it turns out to be a trick question. You humiliate <laughs> the students who thought they were going to please you. <laughs> that's that's not Buddhist. It's not mindful. You need more work. You need to actually join my cult. And nothing short of that will, will, will help. Wait, stop. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show. Uh, available on both streaming video, audio podcasts. You're John Horgan. Science writer, famous for getting into controversies, one of which we'll talk about. Uh, this one having to do with consciousness, mind-body problem. We may get into an actual Buddhist enlightenment or Eastern enlightenment as well in this conversation and may get into other things, but uh, that's who you are. Now let's get back to what an irresponsible professor you are. That was really, uh, that was really a low blow there. That was no. I'm, I I try to be honest with my students. I tell them about stuff I'm going through, and I try to um, to tell them about my own misgivings and that I have a monkey mind and I can't control it at all, and that's just the way it is for me. And so I'm curious about how they would respond to trying to be uh, mindfulness and then we mindful. And then we have a little discussion about it. And, um, you know, there's a little bit of movement toward enlightenment in the room. <laughs> I'm actually a fan of looking at it that way. The, the idea of incremental enlightenment, enlightenment is a process and not a goal. I, that's a big, a big theme in uh, my own, my own book on this, which happens to be called why Buddhism is true, by the way. Um, and, uh, so, and Come into my school to talk about it. I am going to talk at to the you. end of February, and I'm already building lots of anticipation for that. And, well, don't don't raise the expectations too high. Did we tell people where you teach? I teach at Stevens Institute of Technology, a hardcore engineering school in Hoboken, right across from Manhattan. Mm -hmm. All true. And like, also, you've written a bunch of books, uh, and you're writing you're writing a book. Uh, that we may talk about. Uh, I may give you some guidance on this book because it, it it is has something to do with the mind body problem. I may want to argue that it should have less to do with that than you're currently envisioning. But we'll we'll get to all of that. Let's start with your latest uh, your latest controversy. I mean, you know, you remind me of uh, you know. Did you ever read the Curious George books to your to your kids? Or do you, you don't remember Curious George? I remember them from my childhood by H. A. Ray. Curious George was a monkey, and there would always be this, at the beginning, near the, as I recall, somewhere in the beginning of each story, 
uh, George's like owner or something, I think, would say, now don't get into trouble. But Curious George would always get into trouble. And, you know, that's like, mind. what? It's the monkey mind. I can't It's the monkey it. mind in you, maybe. But you, you, you have a history of, uh, I, is arousing antagonism too strong a word? You write, a, you write about scientists sometimes, or philosophers, in a way that makes them dislike you. Now, uh, we should, uh, in, on your behalf, I would say that a lot of scientists and philosophers have been, especially in the kind of old pre-internet days, but are used to, they're kind of like athletes in the sense that they're used to journalists being PR agents for them. There's a lot of science writing historically that has been like totally suck up. You're the hero. You you know you're the you're the you're share your wisdom with me. You tell me what's important and I'll write it. You know, just as a lot of sports writers uh, are are you know are basically there to glorify athletes. Again, this has changed somewhat with the internet, and maybe maybe that's part of your own story. But but it's fair to say, and the latest controversy, I guess, uh, involves Daniel Dennett, and we'll get into that. But am I right so far? Yes. Let me just say, as far as critical science journalism goes, that's my job. I, I see being a critic of what scientists and philosophers say um, as being fundamental to what I do. I'm not writing press releases for these people. They all have departments at their universities or institutions to write press releases for them. My job is to look very carefully at the kinds of claims that they're making and try to distinguish something that really makes sense, that seems to have some substance to it, from just total bullshit. And what's great for me is that there's so much bullshit out there. And, and I feel like I have, I have it sort of not entirely all to myself because there are plenty of critical science journalists out there, but not as many as there are journalists who do – just celebrate the achievements of science and just try to explain it to the public. That's fine, but I think the critical part is essential because science is so important. Yeah. So that, that's how I justify being an asshole occasionally to scientists and yeah. philosophers. And by the way, I mean, a good example of how critical journalism uh, could help is uh, – there was finally a big uh, controversy and reckoning that should have come a lot sooner in psychology, where it turned out that a lot of these experiments, people had written whole best-selling books on the basis of findings that turned out to be dubious. And, right. and, 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 and it turns out nobody had been really replicating the experiments and, 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 and trying to verify the initial claims and when they did, if they if they if they came up with something negative, nobody would publish it, and so on. And so, and now, uh, much much of recent psychology is being reevaluated, and whole themes aren't holding up very well. And and, yeah. and and if you ask what was going on, well, it was like because the journalism was so uncritical, and in fact, it was the opposite of uncritical. It was like, show me the sexiest finding you've got, and we'll put that in the New York Times. Uh, New York Times wasn't the worst offender, but, you know, I think journalism broadly favors the sensational. Um, and, you know, so so scientists had been getting reinforcement for yeah. dubious but but dramatic findings. And, Bob, it's not – it really pisses me off when the scientists blame it on the uh, the lay media because the uh, the technical scientific – uh, media, the peer-reviewed journals, science and nature, they also should bear a lot of responsibility for this because they also, like the rest of us, are trying to boost their traffic numbers. And so they are more inclined to uh, publish and then promote the really surprising, sexy stuff. And you're right, then that reinforces the tendency of the scientists to go with their most unusual surprising claims which also are most likely to be wrong mm -hmm. over the long run so it's this kind of big self-reinforcing process that only now is coming to light this is part of what's now called the replic replication crisis it's not just 
psychology and the social sciences. It's all the way across science. And um, it's unclear how it's going to settle out, but it, it's a huge problem right now. The scientific literature, it's become apparent, is just highly unreliable. And, and then, so of course, the science journalism is going to be unreliable as well, which means there's even more of a need for, for the kind of critical science writing that I was just talking about. Um, so, yeah, I mean, this is a serious business, especially if you're talking about biomedicine. You know, there, there's a huge problem in replication of results related to uh, cancer, mm -hmm. cancer tests and cancer treatments. Um, yeah, and here you get into, you know, pharmaceutical companies subsidizing research. Uh, it used to be that scientists weren't good about disclosing their funding. I think there are some rules in place now or at least some new norms. Um, yeah. But anyway, if if uh, if uh, you want to want me to tell you about this this recent post I had on yeah, so this is a little different because Dan Dennett, the person who got I guess upset, uh, is a philosopher, not a scientist. So this isn't about you know he doesn't do experiments that do or don't get replicated. He has gotten a certain amount of glorification over the years that I think has uh, he has come to believe is the appropriate way to treat him. Part, partly, by the way, because he, he is identified with the new atheists. He's in some ways different from them, but all of them get a kind of a like a rock star treatment. If you've ever been at some of the events with them, Lawrence Krauss, Sam Harris, where, you know, you realize, whoa, I mean, they're used to like this is like Led Zeppelin on tour. I mean, they, they've got they've got just ardent, devoted followers right. who who let's just say, do not routinely subject their views to critical inquiry. And uh, so, so I don't know if that's part of it, but, but uh, I've got my own Dan Dennett stories and maybe we'll have time, but, but um, I, I don't understand what did he, did he get so quite so upset about. Now, you had critically reviewed his latest book, which is, what is it, From Bacteria to Bach or something? Bacteria to Bach, yeah. And, yeah. And, uh, and, and I thought, by the way, I, I reread it last night, I th it's a really good, well-written review that really uh, concisely um, summarizes some issues that I think, uh, and and just really, really pointedly puts um, some of your critiques, and we'll link to it. But 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 that was a little while ago, and then there was what some conference you went to and you reported on uh, in your blog on Scientific American or what? Yeah. So let me let me back up a little bit. Um... You, I think you mentioned that I'm writing this book. I'm actually just finishing a book on the mind-body problem, which encompasses consciousness. It's basically how do you go from matter uh, to consciousness to uh, morality, meaning, free will. There's this big disconnect in science going from the material world to all the things that um, – that uh, all the dimensions of, of being human. And uh, to me, this is the deepest question in science and philosophy. And a lot of other questions end up down in the realm of the mind-body problem. So I've been going – I happen to live across the river from NYU where David Chalmers and Ned Block have this program for uh, philosophy of mind. And they have these fantastic conferences on different mm -hmm. aspects of the mind-body problem. And the most recent one, just a couple of weeks ago, was on animal consciousness. So one of the big questions is, um, what other kinds of things besides humans are conscious? Uh, does it feel like something to be a butterfly, a bat, um, a smartphone possibly? This particular com conference focused on, uh, on animals, um, fish, lamprey. Uh, there was a discussion at one point of by Peter Singer, the great ethical philosopher, over whether cockroaches and bed bugs might suffer, and if so, um, what we might do about it. What was great about this? I know one way to end their suffering. <laughs> right, <laughs> and I've <laughs> exercised it in the past. But is there is there a humane? Uh, Singer actually was dealing with this seriously. Is there a humane way? Okay, we don't like cockroaches in our apartments, uh, but is there a humane way to get rid of them, a way to poison them that doesn't cause them too much uh, too much pain? Um, and 
Also, there was a discussion about when evolution and how evolution emerged in, I mean, excuse me, consciousness emerged in evolution and what, what components of a mind are kind of prerequisites for consciousness. Uh, is it, um, is it just basic perception? Is it just reaction to stimuli and moving away from a harm, harmful stimulus and moving toward a, a, a positive one? So there's all this discussion. And um, meanwhile, there's Dan Dennett there who has suggested in his writings that not even humans are that conscious. Dennett sort of dances around this, but he comes very close to saying that consciousness – isn't really a thing. He calls consciousness an illusion. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, right there in the front uh, row of the audience, um, listening to a lot of the talks, um, and a lot of the talks were fascinating with details about exactly what uh, fish do and what they might experience when they're exposed to uh, noxious stimuli. But right in the front row was Thomas Nagel, uh, one of the great philosophers of the 20th century, he wrote a, an essay, 1974, called What Is It Like to Be a Bat, right. uh, that basically expressed dissatisfaction with materialist accounts of, um, of consciousness. Yeah. Meanwhile, there were, some, there were some other people in the audience who were um, fans of uh, something called integrated information theory, which basically says that everything is conscious, that consciousness might even be within individual protons because they are passing well, information well that, that particular view can, let me let me uh, interject a couple of things i mean one is that particular view as you've just put it is also called panpsychism so this integrated information theory would be a particular uh kind of version of pants or or or, or, or a, a, a a means of of exploring uh i guess a panpsychist view or something but but yes and by the way i want to remind you you had this event a couple of years ago with David Chalmers and Rebecca, David Chalmers, the philosopher who was one of the organizers of this meeting right. at NYU, and Rebecca Goldstein, the yeah. novelist, right. who has a PhD in philosophy, and her thesis advisor was Thomas Nagel. Right, that was at and, Union Theological Seminary. Yeah, and um, and both of them are also lean toward panpsychism. They think that consciousness is, is latent within matter. They have their own reasons for... Uh, believing that the point I'm trying to make is that at this conference, it was like a microcosm of philosophy of mind in general. Uh, there was this huge range of opinions about how pervasive consciousness is from the extreme uh, position of Dan Dennett saying maybe we're not even that conscious to yeah. people who say everything is conscious. Yeah. And let me just stop and, and just, just interject one thing, which is that, and I think we may get into this. When you say Dennett uh, says that maybe we're not that conscious, I mean, I think the truth about Dennett is when people try to figure out what he's actually saying, some yeah. people think, including me, I think, the, that the only intelligible interpretation of what he's saying is that consciousness does not exist at all. Which is a philosophical position, which used to be called behaviorism, with a with a uh, not the kind of behaviorism in in psychology. It's a different use of the term. His mentor Gilbert Ryle was a behaviorist. Dan's mentor Gilbert Ryle wrote a book called The Concept of Mind, which introduced uh, the phrase "the ghost in the machine" in a kind of derisive way. Like, wait, if you believe there's consciousness, you're believing there's some ghost in the machine of the brain. Um, and it has been. Uh, said about Dennett, and before I say anything that might sound critical of him, I should say by way of full disclosure, I've had my own kind of run-ins and controversies. I hope I'll have time to talk about one, so maybe I'm not to be trusted. But, but I mean, I ran into a philosopher once who said, you know, Dan Dennett is a crypto-behaviorist. He won't admit that his view amounts to saying consciousness doesn't exist. He's basically just saying what his mentor said, but his mentor at least had the courage to say that that's what he believed. This is what this guy said. And and so I, when you say Dennett believes that we're not that conscious, that's almost a compromise between the two interpretations of him. Like one is one is no, he's really saying. And, and, and as you know, he gets really upset when you say that he's saying consciousness doesn't exist. But it's like unclear what he's saying if he's not saying that it is at least a common view. Well, so 
he can be very confusing. And I wrote this piece, I guess it was last summer, um, about his, his views on consciousness to, to try to figure out for myself what he's really saying. You're right that he has this rhetorical style of saying something incredibly provocative, like we're all zombies, and then retracting it immediately. And so he sort of dances back and forth around this, this very extreme position, which would be just ridiculous that we're not we're not uh, conscious. Any, well, that any, is a view in philosophy that consciousness does not exist. That is a but view. If you say if you accuse him of saying consciousness doesn't exist, he he blows a gasket. He I know, I know. I've seen, and he's done it with me. I know. It's good. So it's fun. Here's, here's what he's trying to really say. He's not trying to say it doesn't exist. He's trying to say that it's unimportant, that it's trivial. Um, Hold and, on now. Hold on now. Subject, we're talking about the existence of subjective experience, okay? Yeah. The fact that, as Thomas Nagel put it in that essay, it is like something to be you. Now, once you right. ponder the fact that you can imagine a planet where evolution happens and it's not like something to be the animals, right? Yeah. Well, then it's kind of like, it's kind of worth thinking. It's kind of amazing. But, but to say it's not significant, look, it's the reason we can suffer and have joy. If there were no subjective experience, nothing would matter. How can he say, and I'm not, I'm not even saying he does, I'm taking your word for it. How could anyone say, well, yes, yeah, subjective experience exists, but it's not important. That's flat out crazy. In other words, he, he means that it's not important in the sense that once we're done explaining the physiological correlates of conscious experience, that's all there is to say about it. There's nothing weird about it that remains to be explained after you have, you know, your model with the neural correlates, uh, neurons. It just doesn't inter- hold up precisely because you can imagine an animal with all that physical stuff going on, all that neurological action, and precisely because being of a scientific frame of mind you think that that is a sufficient explanation of the organism's behavior precisely because of that you can imagine the organism not having subjective experience so so the subjective experience remains something that is unexplained after all that right and it's such a simple and straightforward argument and, and I think one, one reason Dennett gets upset is that more and more people are realizing it. I mean, his star has kind of fallen a little within uh, philosophy. and and In part because of David Chalmers, who sort of, in a way, was picking up the ball from Thomas Nagel, the previous generation of, of uh, philosopher, and running with it and saying, no, consciousness is a big deal. It, he, he was the person who coined the, the phrase, the hard problem to describe uh, consciousness. Dennett has argued endlessly that the, the, the problem is not hard and, and um, that, you know, we've basically already explained consciousness except for figuring out some details. But the point I'm trying to make is, again, that there you have all these different opinions. How can you possibly resolve them? And um, I don't think you can resolve them. One of the problems when you're talking about consciousness is what the, the term that I use is, uh, is solipsism. It's the idea that I know I'm conscious. I'm experiencing that right now, right. but I can't be absolutely sure that you're conscious. Descartes talked about this. Right. A lot of people have talked about it. Um, it's reasonable for me to assume that you are conscious because you look like me, you act like me. We're having this complicated discussion right now. But when you move away from humans toward even, you know, chimpanzees, monkeys, and then especially, um, you know, fish, jellyfish, smartphones, really smart people come out on totally different sides of of yeah. those debates. And I'm trying to say we'll never solve those problems because we have no way of solving the solipsism problem. Right. We don't, we don't, so Christoph Koch, this, I, this is a – a really fantastic, brilliant neuroscientist. He's been a um, he's been studying consciousness for almost thirty years now. He's been a source of mine for for more than twenty five years in writing about mind body issues, consciousness. He proposed a few years ago that that science might create some called something called a consciousness meter, right. which would be a device 
that can measure whatever it is that accounts for consciousness and different things and uh, determine not only whether they're conscious or not, but how conscious they are, and maybe even say something about the internal structure of the consciousness. What does it mean? Well, what does it feel like to, to see the color red and, and those sorts of things? I don't think that's possible. I don't think we'll ever have a consciousness meter. Um, and I, you know, I explain why in this, this, uh, this post of mine. And therefore, I don't think we'll solve the solipsism problem. And therefore, these different views from eliminative materialism of Dan Dennett all the way up to panpsychism, everything is conscious. They're, they're just opinions. Right. You choose one over the other for completely subjective or even emotional reasons. Some people, I think, really prefer to think that humans are special or they even prefer to be hardcore materialists who just deny us uh, free will or a spirit or a soul and others like Deepak Chopra uh, spread consciousness out through the entire universe right and, um, whether or not you prefer one way of looking at the world or another it's it's uh, it's totally your choice now I agree that the the solipsism problem is pretty fundamental I mean another way of putting it is that uh, you know science is built on the uh, on publicly observable findings you do an experiment anyone who wants to watch can see what the findings are and then you can discuss that subjective experience is not publicly observable and right. so that's why people who say well I, science has solved everything else why should we think consciousness is, is different precisely because unlike temperature and velocity and mass and all of these other things, you can't measure it in a way that is publicly observable. You just can't. And, and yeah. that is uh, why it's so mysterious. And, and it, 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 um, it's mysterious because you can imagine a world in which it doesn't exist, uh, and yet evolution proceeds. Uh, and then it's it seems destined to, to remain mysterious because it is not amenable to the traditional means of scientific examination. So, and as, and as you said before, without consciousness, I mean, this is an important issue that 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 has very serious implications for how we look at ourselves. Uh, so, without consciousness, basically, there's no morality. Morality just just vanishes. If you have a universe of automatons that have no internal sensations that aren't capable of the subjective experience of suffering, who gives a shit whether yeah. you torture them? By, by the way, not to plug more than one of my books in one sitting, but you know where you will find possibly the earliest uh, statement of exactly what you just said? Uh, moral Animal? No, Three Scientists and Their Gods. Ah, 1988. Yes. Right. It probably isn't the earliest, but it's there. Yeah, no, it's it's uh, it's you, you've paved the road for me, Bob. I'm just, I'm yeah, just yeah. going uh, you, you walking stand, behind you. Stand you. on the shoulders of giants. <laughs> but uh, the great thing about the mind-body problem is that there's no bottom to it. It's just so deep and rich. Um, I, I was talking to Rebecca Goldstein. You know, so in this book I'm writing, I it's basically uh, portraits of nine people who have wrestled with the mind-body problem for personal reasons as well as intellectual reasons. They've had some sort of difficulties in their lives and they're, 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 um, they're trying to uh, overcome these difficulties in part through their intellectual work by understanding themselves and the world in a particular way. And so I, one of the people I, I uh, profile is Rebecca Goldstein and um, – and she said that uh, – and she's obsessed. She has been since she, she was a child with a mind-body problem. She said that Schopenhauer, you know, the great gloomy German philosopher, called the mind-body problem the world not. And I love that phrase because it, it evokes the sense that I have that the mind-body problem is just tied to everything. The more you think about it, the more you realize it's related to not only – our individual struggles to be good people and to create meaningful lives for ourselves, but also to the, you know, the great human adventure um, 
there's a collective version of the mind body problem. What, what can we be in the future? What, what are the actual physical possibilities um, for humans? And then what should we be? You know, what, what, what is our best self? What do we want ourselves to be in the future? What's the, what's the best kind of, what's the best form of social organization we can have that makes us, uh, that enables us to live really fantastic lives? I know you, you've dealt with that problem as well. That was part of, that was the, the theme of your book, um, your book Non Zero. And, uh, and you know there there are no final answers to this. One of the premises of my book is that um, it's a mistake to think that there is a, and I, and this is something I've realized in my own case only recently. It's a mistake to think that there is an answer, a universal, final, objectively true answer for any of these mind body questions: consciousness, morality, meaning of life, free will, uh, because they're inherently subjective there's no way to reduce them to something that can be viewed totally objectively i'm not i, I mean I, you know i should on that note i i earlier said consciousness is destined to remain a mystery i sh maybe shouldn't have been quite so strong maybe there will be some mode of analysis that that clarifies the the the, the issue greatly but i would say it's not so much that I think there's no one true. An I mean, I think, for example, free will and determinism, it could be that there is an actual answer, but that's not the same as saying that humans will ever be able to figure it out. I, I mean, it, you know, it, it, I, I, I think we are, there just may be intrinsic limits on what we can grasp. I mean, we're just this little, these little things in the system. And, 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 and there is this weird dichotomy about us, which is that we have a, physical manifestation but also this interior subjectivity and we can't even figure that out and 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 and, and again it may be a, a a permanently intractable problem now before we but before we get further into this and into your book and i do want to talk about your book the book you're writing um i i, I teased this controversy business so you have to talk a little about what what happened with the so you were at this conference dan dennett gets mad at you what what why i i read both now, I read your earlier review of his book. I can see why he wouldn't uh, like that. I mean, here's a, here's a sentence uh, from it. Uh, science has real enemies, some in positions of great power, but Dennett doesn't do science any favors by shilling for it so aggressively. That's a line he might not like. I can think of others. But, you know, I thought it was a, it was a smart and fair review. And then, you wrote a, and then you wrote a post about this conference and... I don't know. Was it that you called him an eliminative materialist? I mean, we'll link to both of these things. I couldn't figure out, like, what did he get so upset about? Okay, well, he, he I, I'm, I'm going to be a little cagey in talking about this uh, because, you know, we have this, had this private email exchange. I'll just say that he, um, I put it this way, he, he thinks to be critical of his ideas means not to understand them. Well, many of us, many of us feel that way. That's a common human reaction to criticism. But, right. Yeah. And, and so, and so he was telling me that I misunderstood his views, um, and, uh, misrepresented them. And, um, and then he's sort of trying to set me straight. You mean and, on the eliminative materialism point, which is, by the way, a technical term, which itself is kind of cloudy. If you ever look it up, it's like, well, do eliminative materialists say that there is no consciousness or or what? And, 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 and the standard kind of Wikipedia answer is kind of, well, kind of a little or something. So so it's fuzzy in itself. But is that is that the term? Yeah, uh, that that is the term. And he's got a he's that's, got a that's of, what upset him. Well, no, th there are some other things. I described this exchange with him and Tom Nagel oh. at the end of the conference, and he thinks that I mischaracterized it, and uh, Nagel also thought I mischaracterized it. So I, I, that I wasn't wrong, but I didn't have it quite right, and there were some details, there were some nuance that I missed. So I have a little correction on, or a note from Nagel appended to my uh, blog. I also said that Nagel seemed aggrieved when he was talking to Dennett. And Nagel said he wasn't aggrieved. 
And Dennett also said, and then, and in my piece, I said, Nagel seemed aggrieved when he challenged Dennett's materialism. And then Dennett seemed aggrieved when he responded. And both of them said they were not aggrieved. Well, first of all, you didn't say they were aggrieved. You said they seemed aggrieved. I mean, that, that I, I, I don't, and I'm not just splitting hairs. I mean, that was your perception and you, right. you, you put it appropriately. Yeah. So, yeah. And in a way it kind of, you know, the, the, at the end of my post, I said we cannot ab- ex- escape our subjectivity when we wrestle with the problem of subjectivity. And this was like a confirmation of just what I said. Hey, you look kind of irritated when you were talking to each other. But hey, but you know, if you weren't, um, then that's fine. I'll I'll have to believe what right. you said. Right. Uh, so it was kind of funny. I felt like, I mean. I, I just see confirmations of my point of view everywhere. But you know, was, that people are like that too, John. You, this, yeah, is, yeah. this is built into us. But I'm basically saying that uh, that is that is inescapable. You're right. It is built into us, and we should always aspire to be objective and rational, but it's not possible. Well, and, it is. it is possible to make some progress with something like confirmation bias, which is what we're talking about. Yeah, being aware of it. I personally think even mindfulness meditation can help, but it, it's a challenge. Escaping it entirely would would perhaps be part of enlightenment, if indeed such a thing exists. But that would have to be part of enlightenment: is escaping confirmation by his holy. Well, I the the way I look at it is by acknowledging your limitations. Um, you don't overcome them entirely because that's impossible, but. Um, that is a more intellectually honest stance uh, to say, yes, I'm, I'm biased. I'm going to try to overcome that. I'm going to do my best. But it's, it's, it's always going to be a losing proposition ultimately. So it leads to this kind of modesty and humility in approaching these really huge old philosophical problems that Socrates and people like that wrestled. Um, what is the relationship between matter and mind? What does it mean to be a good person what does it mean to, to live a meaningful life? The, the, the great intellectual error that a lot of people have made um, is to think that there is a true answer to all those things, a true answer that applies to everybody. All religions, in a way, have said there is a true answer to these sorts of questions. Buddha, one of the differences between us is that you seem to think that, that Buddhism has some pretty good answers to these problems and i just disagree i think well, i think I, i'm first of all, i'm distinguishing the buddhist the the more traditionally religious parts of buddhism yeah. as their practice which includes you know appealing to deities and uh talking about what gets you a favorable afterlife in the sense of a, a propitious rebirth and all that that's not what i'm talking about i'm talking about buddhism as a as a, as a, as a psychology and and uh, philosophy, but I, I, I do uh, I do defend it pretty strongly. Yes. Let me, let me just let me go back up, and this is actually playing off something that that you you said earlier in terms of whether you know science can sort of catch up to humans and and really define us or capture us in some sort of model. One of the reasons I think that will never happen is because um, we're a constantly moving target. I, I the to me, one of the ways that I, I put it in, in, uh, in my book is that humans are a work in progress. As individuals, we're works in progress. And certainly as a species, we're constantly changing. Uh, you know, we remain the same, but we're also constantly changing in really fundamental ways. We can change dramatically because of the new ideas that people propose about us. Um, you know, Marx had this powerful way of of describing humans. And then, you know, a lot of people really ran with that and changed the world as a result of it. Freud, there's still lots of people um, who think that Freud had the best view of, of human nature. You've talked about the ways that Darwin uh, has changed our self-conception. I think there are going to be ways uh, that scientists and philosophers come up with in the future uh, for us to look at ourselves that we can't even imagine yet but that can be very powerful, that can change the way that we imagine ourselves and the way we we relate to each other and actually have an impact on the material world. So that's that's one reason why I don't think 
science can capture us because we're always whatever. Well, no, no, but I do think the basics of the theory of natural selection are going to hold up. I mean, the, the, you never, you, in a certain sense, in a certain technical sense, you never know for sure that a scientific theory has got things right. But, 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 but my confidence in, in the basics of natural selection, which is to say that, you know, uh, significant information gets transmitted by genes, significant in the sense that it shapes the organism and the organism's traits, A, and B, uh, those genes most conducive to their own replication, by definition, come to pervade the gene pool, and that accounts for the basics of life as we see it. Of course, it doesn't solve problems like consciousness, but in terms of the physical structure of life. I, I think the chances of that being displaced. Now, there could be new news about how genetic variation arises, you know, what leads to new traits and so on. But, but the part of it I just described, I think the chances of that turning out to be wrong are like one in... I don't know whether I'm in six figures or seven. I'll go with seven. One in five million or something. I mean, I do think, you know, confident, you know, confident knowledge is built up or knowledge we can be confident in is built up through science. I agree with you. I am a hardcore fuddy-duddy scientific realist in, in many senses. I think scientists discover truths about the world. I'm, I'm only a... A postmodernist when it comes to humans. So yes, theory of evolution by natural selection, absolutely. Especially when you combine it with with modern genetics, it, it it says a lot about about organisms, including humans. But when you talk about the implications of evolutionary theory for humans specifically, it's not telling us that much. It, it tells us a lot, but there's a lot that that um, that remains uh, still mysterious and subject to a lot of debate. And, and my argument is that it always will. Just as an example, how you deduce some kind of moral principles from evolutionary theory, how we decide what's right and wrong. You know, I, don't think you, I don't think you can deduce moral principles from evolutionary theory. It's, it doesn't do everything. That, right. would, that would be scientism. Yeah, and there are some people who have actually jumped from is to ought in that way. And I, I think that is, I think you can make reasonable claims in that area. You can talk about human flourishing and by looking at, at um, happiness and things like that. It's just other manifestations. Oh, oh of sure. Health. I think, I think, I think I, I'm a big advocate of, of, of having discussions about morality and human welfare and, and so on and public policy for that matter in light of the knowledge we get from uh, biology and, in my view, evolutionary psychology, it's just that you can't deduce your fundamental values from those. You have to start right. out deciding, like, well, we, as humans, we've decided human happiness matters, for example. That's a value I'm positing. Yeah. Now that, so I've got, I've got a foundation of value if I posit that or any number of other values I might posit. And then you can, then you can have the discussion that is informed by you know, and, uh, you know, if you want to figure out how to best realize values or get people to behave well or whatever, then science can help. But 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 our definition of, of what behaving well is or and our fundamental values can't come from science is my view. Right. Yeah. So I you know, and and that leads me again to this conclusion that um, that we're left with these we're left with opinions. And it's a matter of of. Um, being modest about our own personal claims and recognizing that there are other people who are well-meaning and smart and well-informed who have totally different views of the world than we do. And we have to reach some kind of uh, compromise. And so I think it's just better if we give up the idea that there should be convergence at some point in the future uh, on certain real definite universal answers to these big questions related to consciousness, morality, and meaning, and see all our ideas as suppositions, as conjectures, as opinions, as inherently subjective, mm -hmm. and give ourselves as much freedom as possible to choose among 
different ideas. I do think that, you know, I've got a lot of philosophy in this book and it's it, philosophy. Again, there's a tremendous range of opinion. There, there are some philosophers. There was a guy named Derek Parfit right. who still believed in the idea that you could deduce moral principles that would have the same status as scientific truths. And at the and then at the other extreme, you've got uh, moral nihilists, people who say that um, there's no uh, more, the phrase moral truth is an oxymoron. That um, you know it, this this started with Nietzsche, and you can probably find uh, precedents. Mm. So the conclusion that I draw from that is not that one side or the other is right, but um, but that we should be modest and we should allow for as much as many choices as possible, and um, and what we decide is is a good or bad way to live. Yeah. Now. So yeah, and, and here, uh, I, I mean, do you want to talk about your book more? You want me? I've already given you the feedback I'd give you about about your book, and and, and I I think. Um, this is my concern about your book is that you're going to, you're going to spend a lot of time saying that kind of thing. And, and I mean, it's fine, but what, when you first started talking uh, about me in this book, you were talking about some people you were interviewing who had some like crazy and fascinating stories. And these yeah. were, these were, some of them were scientists, ostensibly people I had thought of as scientists or whatever, Who's, who had had dramatic life experiences that in some cases, uh, and I don't think this applies to Rebecca Goldstein, whom you already mentioned uh, as one profile subject, but in some cases had led them to go like off the reservation, so far as science is concerned. Like they right. now believed in the, in, in the paranormal, or they believed in this, or they believed in that. And, and, and I kind of thought like th that would be a, fa a fascinating book, would be a kind of driven to extremes book. People yeah. who start out in a scientific frame, and, and they aren't just cranks you've never heard of. I mean, some of these were people I'd definitely heard of, uh, and uh, but they they something dramatic happens. One of their offspring dies, or they do this, or they do that, and uh, and and they move in a different direction. It seems to me that's one kind of fascinating book, um, and it's a unifying theme in itself. But you kept describing it as a book about the mind-body problem. And I thought, well, wait a second. If you're going to – it can be that. If you want it to be a book that through these profiles adds up to some kind of commentary on the mind-body problem, fine. But then you're going to have to exclude a lot of the most fascinating people, right? Because, you know, it's just I don't, I don't see how, how the one kind of book adds up to the other kind of book. Well, so there, there are – the meta theme – is what I was just telling you, which is that uh, our views of the mind-body problem are fundamentally subjective. There, there are empirical objective components to it. For example, uh, when you're studying consciousness, you can look for the neural correlates of consciousness, and there's a lot of work done there. And um, you know, some of that's really interesting, and there have been some conclusion, conclusions uh, made about which parts of the brain are are uh, essential for consciousness, but then you, you run into the solipsism problem when you're trying to universalize uh, what you've learned about the human brain and apply it to, to other sorts of things, and then it becomes subjective. Same thing with um, with morality and meaning, and the way. But the way I try to dramatize that, instead of having one long essay about that, which I think would be boring, I try to dramatize it by showing these really deep thinkers whose views of themselves and of the universe and the relationship between humans and, and the rest, rest of reality have been profoundly shaped by personal experiences. Uh, so Rebecca Goldstein, for example, um, grew up in a very uh, orthodox Jewish household. And, you know, she she had this really close relationship with her father. She revered him, but she became uh, an atheist when she was very young. And and I think that that has something to do with her her adult views on uh, the mind body problem. Christoph Koch, who I mentioned earlier, this neuroscientist, I think that his embrace of this theory that implies panpsychism has something to do with a midlife crisis. 
that he went through. Mm -hmm. Another person um, in my book had a terrible family tragedy uh, decades ago, and that led him to have a view of consciousness that some people would say is totally beyond the pale. It, it, it implies extrasensory, extrasensory okay. perception and things like that. So, um, you know, and I, and my point of view is not that, that one of these people has the right view. It's, it's that this is how we figure out how the world works. Of course, we're looking for theories that make sense to our yeah. version of rationality, but that also are consoling to us. Yeah. Um, that match up, help us make sense of some terrible trauma that we've uh, we've dealt with, and um, and that we should just accept that. Well, maybe I'm making a, almost a point about marketing angle, which is I think you're going to get a lot more mileage describing this as a glimpse into the minds of these eccentric people who have been driven to have these divergent and in some cases extreme views by the intensity of their experience as human beings than saying. I'm here to tell you, you know, in other words, that's a better marketing angle than here's my the argument I'm making in this book. And believe me, I've tried to do both. The the, the uh, but but, uh, you know, and for different audiences, different things will work anyway. That sounds good. That sounds as you describe it now. I'm on board. I'm a, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll I'll buy your book. Uh, the the uh, let me quickly say a couple of things. Well, first of all, an asterisk. Christopher, is it Koch or Coke or what do we know how he pronounced his last name? I've heard it so many different ways. I think the correct pronunciation is cock. Yeah, but, but, I don't, but you would I don't, not say that on you would not say that on our program wisely. I think uh, the the um yeah uh, the the um but he is. I had him on Meaning of Life TV. He's not a panpsychist. When you press him. He doesn't even believe all life is has is is sentient, much less that all matter is. Uh, let me let me just turn my uh, phone off. Maybe Sorry. that's him. You can ask him anyway. If I, you should listen to the conversation I had with him on Meaning of Life TV. He's not. He is. He on the one hand, I think he uses the term. On the other hand, he simply is not a panpsychist, unless I'm confused in understanding what he said. Okay, well, that's. I'll bracket okay. that. In his, in his book, in his memoir. He uses the term. Is, I, I personally think that after the book came out, he maybe started getting pushback or something. But he was at best reticent in being a yeah. panpsychist when I talked to him. So you, you should check that out as a just a podcast. Listen to it while you walk to work or something. But um, the other thing is, I guess quickly, I alluded to my own issue with Dan Dennett. But, I mean, should I say something about that as a matter of uh, we can link. We can link to the thing. Uh, all I'd say is, I mean, there was an exchange between. All I'd say was, you know, I had him. I actually was on the original version of Meaning of Life TV that started like 15 years ago, and then had a different format, and then uh, was dormant for a long time, and was resurrected in, in a different form. But um, the deal was, uh, you know, I, I have this argument that uh, that evolution. Um, may have a larger purpose, or you could say a higher purpose, but not in the sense of some mystical force guiding it. It's just nuts and bolts natural selection, but the unfolding of it could be in some sense in the sense of, uh, in the service of a purpose, which wouldn't necessarily mean that it's some greater intelligence that set it up. We could get into the various technical issues, and I've written about them. But the point is, I got I thought I got Dennett to agree to two things in the conversation. And one was, um, okay, there are these certain things that in organisms we take as hallmarks of uh, a purpose that was instilled by natural selection, not by an intelligent being, but by natural selection. And Dennett is comfortable using the term purpose here. Uh, and I talked about some of the hallmarks of purpose. And I said, and aren't, if you back up and view all of evolution as the unfolding of something, just the way the maturation of an organism is the unfolding of something, um, don't we find some of these properties uh, in, in that, at that level as well, these properties that we find, uh, uh, that we see as hallmarks of purpose in, in organisms that, that, that require um, a kind of a special explanation in the sense that 
well, they must have been created by something like natural selection at a minimum to have uh, to have imbued them with this purpose or purpose in quotes or whatever you want to call it. Um, and he basically agreed to two, to two things. He agreed that, well, yes, if, if you, and I, I won't even bother to describe them, he, 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 but he said, yes, if you see X in a system, that is at least evidence, however slight and perhaps not definitive at all, but, but that is evidence of purpose in the sense, careful sense in which we're using the term. If you see X in a physical system, A, and B, we do see X in evolution. If you back up and view all of evolution as the unfolding of this ecosystem, whatever, we do see that in evolution. So you, you can look at the transcript. He says those two things. So then I wrote a piece saying, well, he, although he's a famous atheist, he's admitting that there is at least some evidence of purpose in this sense. Now, he went totally ballistic uh, and says I misrepresented him and he didn't mean that. Now, I, I did a kind of an exegesis of, uh, and we'll link to this, of what he actually says in the series of emails where he's denying that he said, uh, that he meant what I naturally thought he, he you know, was, was a fair inference from what he had said. And yeah. all I will say is, if you do go back and look at this and watch the videotape, do me a favor. Unless you're willing to invest the time it takes to really figure it out, which is a couple of hours, just don't email me or don't, I, I you know, it, it really is a difficult issue to get to the bottom of. But if you get to the bottom of it, I maintain, if you look at this carefully, there is roughly zero chance that he is, that, that, that he's right and, and that, that he's really, and I don't mean he's being consciously dishonest in these emails. I mean, people... They get backed into corners and they convince themselves they didn't do what they did. But if you watch the videotape, there's no way that his subsequent explanations of what he meant hold up. They just don't. And, and, and I know it sounds strange for me to say, look, this guy doesn't know what he meant. That, that's a strange position to be in. All I'm saying is, if you spend a few hours assessing the evidence, he's, he, okay. uh, he's, Bob, he's wrong. I, you know... You, you've told me about this exchange before, and I, I'm just uh, let me let me just give you the outsider's um, point of view. Uh, you know, you you are you are um, very quick on your feet rhetorically, and you are good at making your points, and and so is Dedit. And the most impressive thing about this exchange to me was that you are were clever enough to back this extremely clever person into a corner and get him to say something that seemed to contradict his larger philosophical um, point of view and and that was compatible with your point of view and and that's great but then when at, when he sort of takes it back or denies it afterwards yeah I think you just have to say okay like no, no here's what I'm saying here's what I'm saying there's a number of things he could say he could say you know, I mean, there, there are ways he could have said, I thought you meant this, that might have been plausible. I'm just saying, don't stop where you just stopped. Go. There is an actual series of emails between me and him. And he says, no, I meant this. And I say, Dan, you couldn't have meant that because of this. And he says, well, okay, but I meant this. It's kind of that structure. And I'm just telling you, if you pay close attention there's no way that he actually meant what he now claims he meant. Now, it could be that there's some other sense in which he didn't understand the import of what he was saying. He didn't, he didn't, either he didn't mean to say X is care, evolution has X property, and, or he didn't mean to say X property is indeed at least some evidence of purpose. Maybe he didn't mean to say one of those things. That's possible. Or, or there was some kind of misunderstanding. What I'm saying, John, and I mean this, it can't right. be the misunderstanding that he claims it was. Read, okay. the, uh, read the transcript. What you have done is uncovered uh, the inability of Dan Dennett to say that he misspoke. I think that's – and I, I think maybe you have demonstrated that uh, – uh, my own theory is that that's not quite right. My own theory is that the argument I was making uh, is actually powerful, and 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 he didn't he didn't kind of put two and two together. I presented the separate parts of it, and and I what I what I wasn't quick enough to do was was at the end when he had he had acknowledged those two things I said: uh, evolution is characterized by X, 
X is evidence of purpose. Uh, I thought it was self-evident that he was saying he was conceding uh, the, the what follows that. OK, there's at least some I thought that was self-evident. So I didn't stop. And he complains about this, that I didn't stop and say, so, Dan, what you're saying amounts to this. And he thinks that that was like deceitful of me to not stop. I just didn't think of stopping. I thought it was all clear what we had said. And so he went totally ballistic. And yeah. then there was, a, there was a subsequent thing where he said, uh, somebody says you're repeating that I believe that evolution has purpose. You wrote this long email about how horrible I am and threatening to say horrible things about me. And I, I just emailed and said, Dan, you've been misinformed. I didn't say that. I, I just said you believe evolution is uh, something else. And he said, oh, it's like that old Saturday Night Live thing, never mind. Was that where, uh, was it, you know, where oh, yeah. she'd say, she'd say you know, eagle what, rights. What's all this about eagle rights? And she'd go on and on. And they say, no, we said equal rights. And she'd say, oh, <laughs> never mind. Anyway, <laughs> I, I, I didn't want to. And we get paid to do this. Isn't you know, this great? Well, we're not getting paid to do what we're doing, but uh, so I'm I I, I won't I won't I I shouldn't have gone too deeply into this. But um, the other one, the other thing I want to say quickly to end on a positive note, you're both wrong. What? I think you're both. wrong. That's because you think any statement about any thing of significance is ultimately not the final truth. I don't think. Yeah. In terms of is there purpose to the universe or is there not purpose to the universe? Who the fuck knows? Well, we don't know now, but for example, if, you know, there are these simulation theories, if suddenly, oh. if suddenly, well, fine, okay, I don't believe them either. My point is, it's not inconceivable that it could turn out to be demonstrably true. If the, if the, if the giant hacker who set the thing up shows up and says, hey, yeah. I'm the programmer, there's ways that this programmer could, 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 could you know, prove that that's the truth. Um I, I imagine that as like a giant rent appearing in the sky and this this big nerdy head pokes through and and tells us that, you know, we're well, just living in his we're we're in his computer game. <laughs> now that that wouldn't do it for you? Uh here's the problem I have with that. I've actually written about this simulated uh universe idea. I think it's a terrible idea. I think I, I it's a decadent idea. Um in part because there are real people with real suffering in this world. And to say that this is some kind of simulation and, and like being run by something in another dimension diminishes the, the importance of the suffering in this world. So I hate that idea. Well, I didn't know that it does. I mean, well, there's two scenarios. One is what you're seeing is a simulation and all the beings you see out there don't have subjective experience. So it doesn't matter if they suffer, but there's also the version where the whole thing is a simulation, but for whatever reason, these simulated creatures have subjective experience, pain and pleasure, in which case everything still matters. Yeah. Th that, that, that's the thing. I mean, either it's a nihilistic hypothesis or it's a hypothesis that for practical purposes doesn't matter. Right. It, 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 it had, there's no way of knowing for sure. I mean, this is an old idea. Descartes had his, evil demon that was putting him in the matrix and uh it, uh, you know i get it it's something that i think everybody contemplates what the first time they get high on pot when they're you know they're they're going to college or whatever and then you just put it behind you as a childish thing the idea that serious intellectuals are telling the rest of us to take this seriously to me is says something kind of depressing about our culture <laughs> okay nick bostrom you hearing this isn't he the yeah. philosopher who actually wrote a paper about this? I know. I heard him at one of these wonderful NYU conferences. Mm -hmm. He gave a talk on this, and I think it's uh, I think it's a bad idea. A really a bad in the moral sense. Bad <laughs> idea. Okay, so uh, finally, just to end on a positive note, you know, we talked about Thomas Nagel. Uh, you know, he wrote what's his latest book that got him so much grief? Um, Mind and Cosmos. Right, and uh, there is something negative I can say about that book, which is that I think he has, he expresses reservations about natural selection being a comprehensive explanation uh, for us, you know, complete and comprehensive explanation. And I think at least some of those reservations are ill-founded and, 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 and I personally think he's kind of confused, but I will say reading that book, I, I personally think and, and uh, that Tom, that you're seeing a great mind at work. I mean, oh, yeah. I, I think, and this distinguishes 
and from a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of philosophy you might read, and certainly a lot of popular philosophy books you might read. But but there's just a sense that uh, and sometimes it's not easy to understand what he's saying because it's very compressed and kind of efficient. But you just mm-hmm. get the sense that he is really aware of what the big questions. Well, not just what the big questions are, but a, but a, but a specific big questions uh, that are just out there that uh, that are not appreciated, whose existence is not. Appre- I don't know how to put it, but I mean, I really think uh, that that, that uh, although I disagree with parts of the work the, of the book, that he's a great philosopher. Oh, absolutely! I I think he is. It's part of his modesty, and I he he is pointing out that. Um, you know, we're living in a weird time for science that there, there are some scientists and, and philosophers who have the point of view of, uh, Dennett that science is basically explaining everything. Right. Uh, Lawrence Krauss wrote the, this ridiculous book about how, um, you know, physics is explaining, yeah. has explained all, virtually where the universe came from and uh you know life and consciousness and everything else well, we just, not ju- not just where it came from in the sense that well there was some prior physical thing but he claims it's answered the question of why there is something rather than nothing which is an even bolder challenge which he emphatically failed to to do he just he just didn't do it totally and so nagel in his very sort of methodical careful uh and modest way is pointing out that there are these gigantic gaps in our understanding of the universe and of ourselves and particularly of ourselves origin of life origin of the universe origin of consciousness um and then all the things that come with consciousness which we were t- just talking about and uh, and he was vilified for it and accused of being a, a mystic and a friend of creationists and and um and all these these sorts of horrible things where i you know i think he's being vilified because he's actually speaking the truth and he's pointing out the uh the limitations of science in a very powerful way from the point of view of an atheist by the way he's not a closet um spiritual mystic type himself he's right. somebody who's just looking at the evidence yeah. so i totally agree yeah um okay so we've talked a while we'll link to the, these these posts of yours we'll link to my uh assessment of my email exchange with dennett uh, and anything else that we've talked about. But uh, thanks. Congratulations on your latest controversy. And uh, I hope you continue to stumble into them. <laughs> thanks. I don't think I have any choice. <laughs> no, apparently not. Uh, anyway, good talking to you, Bob, and okay. happy holidays and all that. Okay, see you next time.